Well, as you know, I've been asked to read uh, Gregory Baum's uh, tribute, a tribute um, to Rudy Siebert. And as Rudy will explain after uh, I've read this, um, I did want to say a few things, though. Uh, Gerhard Albert Baum, who is better known as Gregory Baum, wrote this tribute to Rudy Siebert, which was the introductory piece for the late James A. Reimer's edited book, The Influence of the Frankfurt School on Contemporary Theology, Critical Theory, and the Future of Religion, Dubrovnik Papers in honor of Rudolf J. Siebert. Reimer's book, which was published in 1992, was the first of four volumes of edited papers that were presented over the last 43 years in the Future of Religion course. Yeah, Professor Siebert founded in 1977 and has been held annually until this pandemic year at the Inner University Center of Postgraduate Studies in Dubrovnik, Yugoslavia, now Croatia. I read now Gregory Baum's tribute to Rudy. Rudy Siebert is an altogether remarkable thinker whose theological and cultural critical studies deserve the widest attention. What does cultural critical mean? The reader may well ask. Speaking of Rudy's scholarly achievement, I am forced to use unusual words like cultural critical that are not English at all. Rudy thinks and writes English in an idiom derived from a German intellectual tradition, from Frankfurt School critical theory with its roots in the dialectics of Hegel and Marx. But Rudy is a critical theorist with a difference. He is a believer and theologian identified with the Roman Catholic tradition. To understand the work of Rudy Siebert, one must take into account the important experience he had during his childhood in Germany. He resisted Nazism as a boy. Rudy belongs to the tiny minority of Catholics for whom, from earliest childhood on, Catholicism and anti-fascism belong together and are fused into one. As a German boy during World War II, Rudy was an active member of a Catholic parish whose pastor, a dedicated anti-Nazi, dared to preach a critical message from the pulpit. During his Sunday sermons, the congregation lived in fear that the Gestapo would walk in and arrest their parish priest. For Rudy, the double commitment to the Catholic faith tradition and against fascism and its heirs in the present has remained an abiding orientation. In his academic studies after the war, Rudy was greatly impressed by two German scholars, Walter Dierks and Eugen Kogan, who had resisted Hitler during the Nazi years and who now began to publish Die Frankfurter Hefte, a critical left-wing review inspired by the thought of the Frankfurt School of the 20s and 30s. Special about this review was that it was sensitive and open to the Christian tradition, which the philosophers of the Frankfurt School had not been. Walter Dierks was, and still is, a practicing Catholic. Parenthetically, I'd like to add uh, that at the time of Baum writing this tribute, Walter Dierks was still alive. However, uh, Walter Dierks died on May 30th, 1991. In this remarkable intellectual milieu, Rudy was initiated into the critical thought of the Frankfurt School. With the Frankfurt philosophers, Rudy learned to read Hegel, not against Marx, as this was usually done, but as Marx's stepfather, who anticipated some of Marx's insights and offered corrective for other ideas Marx was, proposed, Marx was to propose in the future. Rudy also began to read Hegel with much sympathy from a Christian perspective. He did not understand Hegel as the great rationalist who sought to replace the Christian religion with his own philosophy, but as a great Christian thinker who tried to integrate science and philosophy into a theological understanding of world history. Rudy interpreted Hegel as the last church father. Still a young man, Rudy married a wonderful woman, an American, and decided to move with her to the United States. He brought with him the traditional, family-oriented, 
rule-abiding and priest-respecting Catholicism, Catholicism in which he grew up, as well as the radical theological orientation that saw the Christian gospel as God's truth and power against fascism and all systems that, like fascism, aim at making the world a worthy realm for the elite and assigning the rest of humanity to a subordinate place. Siebert's double commitment was a rare combination. As a citizen, Rudy Siebert became integrated into American society. He taught at a university. With his wife and children, he belonged to a parish and local community, and occasionally he involved himself in the Democratic Party. But as an intellectual, and more specifically, as a Catholic theologian, he remained a singular personality, puzzling to many people. On the one hand, he was the old-fashioned, church-going believer with a traditional Catholic style, and on the other, the radical left-wing critic who denounced the exploitive feature of capitalist society. Since capitalism widens the gap between right and power and tries to make the world safe for the economic elite while assign assigning to the margin an ever-growing sector of the population, Rudy discerned fascist trends in American democracy. For many people, Rudy was a puzzling man. It is worth noting that Rudy did not learn his left-wing critique of society, as did many North American Catholics in the late 60s, from the, late, from the Latin American struggle to overcome the domination of economic empire and the ac accompanying liberation theology. Rudy was the rare Catholic in the United States who had brought a critical approach from his earlier European experience. When I met Siebert in the late 60s and became very fond of him, he was the brilliant, puzzling Catholic thinker, a man of traditional piety who employed a discourse derived from Hegel and Marx that had little connection with the language used by Catholic theologians at that time. In this context, Rudy often felt excluded. He was not listened to. He did not have the influence he deserved. The Christian theological debate in North America went on without taking notice of him. While he taught at Western Michigan University, which was very close to Notre Dame University in Indiana, he was never invited by the Catholic institution to lecture and present his own theological and cultural critical reflections. Even when in the 70s, the critical theory began to exercise considerable influence on North American Christian theologians. Little attention was paid to the work of Rudy Siebert. The thinkers who, who defined themselves as belonging to the Catholic left did not, for the most part, know about Siebert's theology and his practical engagement. In this situa situation, Rudy did not feel sorry for himself. To overcome his isolation, and influenced the contemporary debate, Siebert created an organization of his own, the Summer Institute at Dubrovnik in Yugoslavia, which allowed him to listen to scholars concerned with religion and society from all parts of the world, and in this context, offer his own critical research and reflections. Here he was able to bring together thinkers from what were then called the two blocks, East and West. While the scholars and students who attended these sessions had widely divergent views of society and religion, they were united in their critique of positivism, whether this was scientific economism of the right or the left. Dubrovnik produces an intellectual climate in which the theological and cultural critical ideas of Rudy Siebert could be articulated, discussed, and challenged. Here, Rudy was at home. In Dubrovnik, the German-American theologian became the important mediator between several worlds. There was the intellectual world of Eastern European thinkers, marginalized in their own countries with their humanistic understanding of communism, and the intellectual world of Western European and North American thinker, critical of capitalism, with their yearning for an alternative more just, and more humane society. Cutting across this division 
was the second one, defined by the differing attitudes to religion and in particular to Christianity. Some thinkers believed that society could not evolve far toward a greater to, toward greater justice as long as people clung to an outmoded belief system, while others were convinced, on the contrary, that a society that refused to acknowledge the absolute and unconditional would be tempted to create a highest good of the finite proportion, and in doing so, erect a dangerous idol. In debates of this kind, the thought of Rudy Siebert discloses its full meaning. It ceases to sound abstract. It becomes concrete and practical. In these intercultural discourses, the theologian of the Frankfurt School, if I may call him thus, becomes precise and lucid, while his books reflect the accent of a stranger when read in the United States. Siebert's writing lose this accent when they were read and are read in the context created by scholars committed to justice and humaneness, speaking to one another across the barriers of different cultures. There are other reasons, reasons of a more personal kind, why I admire Rudy Siebert and why it is a joy for me to honor him with this brief tribute. Leading a life of dedication, Rudy has transcended, transcended the separation of passion and intelligence and come to formulate an approach to theological thinking that reflects and integrates the endless sorrow over human suffering and the hope against hope based on the divine promise. The end.